Good morning and welcome. If you would find a seat. Before we begin, um, we have a tiny lost and found. If anybody lost an earring, um, we got it. Somebody found it on the floor. So, if it's yours, have a chance. Welcome to our presentation on housing. Our speakers today are three people involved in the day-to-day -day operations of housing and we should have a really interesting presentation. Our first speaker is Susan Barrientos. Um, she is the Executive Director of Montrose County Housing Authority. She's a local, having grown up in Olathe, graduated from Olathe High, right? Got her degree in business from Western in business administration and accounting. Joined the Housing Authority in 2014, is that right? And uh, started out as an accountant and quickly moved up to the executive director's position. She will be talking about subsidized housing. We've tried to kind of break this into three different parts. So she'll be subsidized. Um, Abby Brewer. Abby has over 15 years of experience in marketing, event coordination, and promotions. She is um, presently director of the Housing Resources of Western Colorado. Previously, she held numerous positions with Valley Food Park Partnership and also Live Well Colorado in Montrose and Olathe. And Abby will be talking about affordable housing. So there is a difference. And our third speaker will be Ian Atha. Ian is with the Atha team at Keller Williams. He's a fourth generation real estate agent. That was new information, I didn't know that. And um, he's a graduate of CMU with a degree in business as well. Ian, it sounds like, lived the life prior to being involved in real estate in terms of the outdoors. He was trip leader and river guide for Riggs um, Adventures of Bridgeway. He was a snowboard instructor at Telluride, and he finally probably decided he better settle down a little bit <laughs> and get a real job. <laughs> so um, he's going to talk to us about market rate housing. It will be real interesting to see the differences. All of them are going to tell you um, where we are now, what the needs are, and what the future looks like, if they can predict that. So, it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to Susan Barrientos. Forum for a while. Um, you'll remember I did a presentation when we were over in the new CASA building. This is a little bit of a pared down version of that. So the Housing Authority was started in 1980 to provide rental assistance to low-income families. That's families, senior citizens, um, and disabled individuals. And how do we do that? We have several <laughs> programs. We have the Section 8 HUD program. We administer both federal and state Section 8 vouchers. We own and manage farm labor housing, multifamily housing, and in the housing genre, that just means any age, um, and elderly and disabled housing. Uh, we are not part of Montrose County, the municipality. Most of the folks we serve reside in Montrose County. Mm -hmm. However, with our federal vouchers, we're able to help folks in Montrose and Uray counties. And because Delta doesn't administer state vouchers, we're also able to help folks in Delta County with our state vouchers. 
So how does the Housing Choice Voucher Program work? It provides rental assistance again to families struggling to make ends meet by paying a portion of their rent. Um, this voucher moves with the tenant from house to house. So typically they get on our program, they get settled into a one-year lease and a one-year uh, obligation to us. At the end of that year, then they are eligible to move to um, a different spot in our jurisdiction or actually we can port them to anywhere in the U.S. or our territories that has a housing authority that administers HUD vouchers. These participants pay about 30% of their income toward rent, and you'll hear me say that several times this morning. So how does the application and waitlist work? Unfortunately, our waitlist is closed. We opened it last September, and after about 10 months, we were well over two years long. So at that point, we closed it. Um, but when we had it open, they would bring in their application, and the waitlist is determined on preference, and I think my next slide will talk about preferences. Um, so we really have tiers. If the bottom tier is the folks with no preferences, and they're all then in time and date order. The next tier up is folks with one preference, and they're in time and date order, and so on. And as I said, the waitlist is over two years long. So the preferences that we use, they get one point if they're homeless, they get a preference point if they're a victim of violence, natural disaster, or government action, and that would be something like imminent domain. Um, if a member of the household is elderly or disabled, they get a point, and if they're working towards self-sufficiency, they get a point. So this means higher education or they have a job. So our voucher funding, we get it from two sources. Um, our federal funding comes from HUD, the Office of Housing and Urban Development, and as you might guess, our state funding comes from the state of Colorado Department of Local Affairs Division of Housing. So our federal HUD vouchers were allotted 178 federal vouchers, and we could spend up to about $87,000 a month for those vouchers. We're also allotted 14 VASH vouchers. These are for homeless veterans. Um, we currently have 178 households housed and nine veterans. And so let's talk about our VASH vouchers. Um, we were awarded these 14 VASH vouchers in 2014. As I said, we currently um, house nine. And so basically HUD and the VA got together and said, let's get this program going for these homeless veterans and we'll provide <coughs> housing, intensive case management, um, and clinical services to these homeless vets so that they can be uh, lead healthy, productive lives within our communities. Colorado Division of Housing has many different kinds of vouchers, um, as well as in addition to just the streamline with the preferences, they also have mental health vouchers. They have vouchers for folks coming out of institutions, whether that's drug or alcohol rehab or a nursing home. And they also have home ownership vouchers. We currently administer 61 vouchers for the Colorado Division of Housing. So let's, how does this work? Well, once the participants get to the top of the list and we have funding, Summer, who's the Section 8 Program Manager in our office, will send them a letter that tells them to come in for an intake. This takes about an hour and a half. She goes over all the rules and regulations of HUD. She tells them what their roles and responsibilities are, what our roles and responsibilities are, and she tells them what we expect out of their landlords. Um, then they're issued a bedroom size voucher, depending on the number of people in their household. Um, and so the general rule is two heartbeats per bedroom. Um, however, there's a little room for some common sense there. If my household were my 12-year-old grandson and me, we would have two bedrooms rather than just one. Um, and then we go to payment standards, and this is where we really struggle. Um, we're not alone. Uh, all across the nation, the payment standards just are not keeping up with um, our current rents. So let's start with the one-bedroom voucher. The state payment standard is 712. The federal payment standard is 719. Now keep in mind, this means that's the most that the landlord can charge if all utilities are included. If all utilities are not included, that amount must go down. And so we did a little, about, oh, I don't know, three weeks ago, did a little research, found some rentals, averaged them out, so 
the average one bedroom was renting for $938. So we're, we're really lagging in the one bedroom. Um, and really not any better in the two bedroom for 930 and 948 and the average rent was 1100 over $1,100. We get a little closer in the three bedroom rentals, not sure why. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, uh, so then let's talk about our farm labor housing. Um, because Montrose is an agricultural community, special assistance is given to uh, U.S. citizens and permanent residents, these are the folks that I think of as having their green card, um, that work in the farming industry. In 1993, 12 duplex units were built on scattered sites throughout Olathe. Um, so we have 24 three and four bedroom family rental units. Um, about 65% of their household income must come from farm labor. And again, 30% uh, of their income goes toward rent. Here's a picture of one of those. Unlike our, our voucher program though, the subsidy with these stays with the unit. So when these families move out, they don't get to take the subsidy with them. The subsidy stays there for the next family that moves in. Um, oh, uh, then our Barbara Court Apartments. So this is our multifamily housing. Again, we have 24 one-bedroom units here. Um, 21 of the 24 are subsidized by rural, USDA Rural Development. And like our farm labor duplexes, the subsidy stays with the apartment. And again, these folks pay about 30% of their income toward rent. Now, the three units that are not subsidized, rural development still requires that we offer them at the rural development market rate. So that, those are offered at $539 a month. So you can see that's about $400 a month less than uh, average market. And there's a picture of our Barbara Court Apartments. We have four buildings with six units in each building. Then we have our disabled and elderly housing in Olathe. Um, this is for low, very low income individuals. And these are folks mostly that are living on $1,000 a month or less social security. So we have 24 one bedroom units here. They must be 62 or older to qualify to live here or 55 or older if they're disabled. Um, these apartments are across from the Olathe Community Center where we're hoping someday soon they'll start serving lunch in person there again. Um, these apartments are subsidized by HUD, and again, the subsidy stays with the unit. There's a picture of those. We have um, six buildings with four units in each building, and you can see each one has a little storage shed out front. Uh, because these folks are very low income, they pay a little less than 30% of their income toward rent. So what did we do last month? I listed all of our programs and the number of participants in each program. So last month we helped a total of 337 households um, to the tune of $135,741. If we annualize that, we're helping folks with their rent uh, a little over $1.6 million a year. We're not the only choice in town. Um, in addition to our Barbara Court, Court Apartments, there are six other complexes in Montrose that have subsidy. Farm labor housing, besides our uh, duplexes, there's an apartment complex in Delta. And for elderly housing, there are, again, are six other complexes besides our Olathe Meadows. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. I don't know how to use the clicker apparently. So now let's talk about need. Um, this is really, really a tough one to put our finger on. Um, so I went through and I listed all of our properties, our, or our Section 8, our Barber Corp, and then I sent an email out to the low income housing managers and asked them how many units they had and how many folks on their wait list. So just for the ones that responded, we have 668 units, and we have another 856 people on the wait list. However, it's really hard to know, are they on more than one wait list? If I was over 62, I could be on all the elderly wait lists, I could be on all the multifamily wait lists, 
If, and in addition to that, if I were retired from farm labor, I could also be on both the farm labor wait list. So it's really tough to know. I just sort of honed in on Woodgate Trails alone, 50 units, and they have another 362 people on that wait list. Again, then it's tough to know, as Abby will talk about homeless, how are, are these people on the wait list, how many are homeless, how many are maybe wanting to retire and sell their home and move into an apartment, how many live at some of these other places and just want to move to Woodgate Trails because it's new. So probably some of each is probably what's going on there. Um, new projects in 2020, Space to Create in Ridgeway, was awarded tax credits for 26 units. They have broken ground, and so that's in process. Um, Delta got funding for an elderly project. Uh, they just received those uh, to build 50 new units. Volunteers of America applied for tax credits this year. They were not successful, probably because those went to Delta. Typically, they only um, award tax credits to our area uh, in one spot a, a year. Um, they're going to reapply next year. They're hoping for funding to remodel 30 units and add 20 more. Um, and what's our next step? We really need a formal housing needs assessment. Um, the previously, previous one was done in 2009, and my predecessor, Tim Hebers, tells me that he got that funded by a grant. Um, after that, the grant funding for housing needs assessments pretty much dried up. 2019, we put a group together to see how we could get one funded. The city was at the table, the county was at the table, Housing Resources, Habitat for Humanity, Hilltop, um, Region 10, several of us. Um, and we were just getting ready to send out requests for proposals when the pandemic hit. So now we were talking not long ago that we're ready to we probably need to sit back down and, and get back into that. And lo and behold, the state is now offering at least partially funded, partial funding for these. So that's where we are headed. That's all I have, and I will turn it over to Abby. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming, and um, I did want one correction. I'm the Community Building and Engagement Director for Housing Resources, so I know she said director, and I just wanted to make, clarify that. But first, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about Housing Resources. So Housing Resources of Western Colorado has been on the Western Slope for about 40 years. Um, our main headquarters is in Grand Junction. We have an office here on Townsend and Montrose, and we also have an office in Durango. We cover about 14 counties um, across the Western Slope. Um, we have property management, so we do have some properties in Grand Junction, about 180 units, including 10 units of transitional housing for veterans, for homeless veterans. Um, we also have a HUD um, counseling program um, that's primarily done in Montre or primarily done in Grand Junction, as well as a self-help program. Um, we do own eight lots here, so the hope is that we can do self-help um, building, which is very similar to Habitat for Humanity. Um, but my main goal is community building and engagement. And so it's kind of a new line of business for um, Housing Resources of Western Colorado. And kind of my goal was to really see where the gaps are in the community and try to meet those gaps in some of the communities that we serve. So of course, since I live here <laughs> and the pandemic hit, um, um, I really had to stay put um, in the Montrose area. So in the last year and a half um, since the pandemic hit, one thing that really occurred to us, the gap was meeting the need, especially around people that are experiencing homelessness. And what does that data really look like? Um, and how we actually started this was, um, we, we had a, um, a committee that we met with, just needs committee around the pandemic itself. And one thing that we did have in our community was making sure that people that were experiencing homelessness had a shower. I mean, it was like this total simple thing, but at the same time, it was really hard to do. And so we started doing a hotel voucher program 
And now, a year and a half later, we've served over 150 households um, that are experiencing homelessness and, and really looking into other programs that we can do. But I know I'm supposed to talk about affordable housing, and so the one thing that you have to understand about affordable housing is 30% of your income is affordable. So again, that's where we're having a challenge in our community. As you all well know, it's really hard to find rentals, and um, if you really want to look at that, so a grocery store attendant makes approximately maybe $15 an hour. So that's only $31,200 um, per year. So when you're looking at a house that's right around $2,000 or $5,500, they're paying well over 30% of their, um, their income on rent. That is not affordable. So it's really what we're seeing is an increase in homelessness. Right now, we have about 20% of the people that are experiencing homelessness are families, and they have children. So that's just the people that we're working with. Um, for the um, most of the families that we're working with, too, have this is the first time of ever being homeless. Um, and this is within the whole area. Um, let's see. The gender is usually a woman. And um, they usually have a disability of some sort. Um, and the, one of the key factors of actually somebody becoming homeless is actually a disability and some kind of medical issue. Either it's with a family member that had a major medical issue and just kind of put them on the, on the road to not being able to pay their rent and their um, medical bills and everything else or um, they got sick themselves and had to actually step back from work. So, also, I mean, veterans, we don't um, work primarily with a lot of veterans because Volunteers of America and other individuals have um, some other programs to work with homeless veterans, but I would say that our, our veteran um, homeless rate is, is very high in this community as well. So again, kind of going back to the affordability, and most of the individuals that are experiencing homelessness in this community are working poor. And so they're in your, um, they're working at McDonald's, um, Dollar General, or those places, um, and they have to get two or three jobs to actually pay the rent. So about 30% of those individuals are living in their cars. So you might not even know it, um, that you're actually seeing somebody that's actually homeless in this community because they can't afford rent. So. so in the last year and a half, like I said, we've been working with um, also a group, um, a lot of people, Ariana Aging, um, Volunteers of America, of course, Montrose County Housing Authority, to put together a work plan. And so we call it the Montrose Action Plan. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but um, this is a Montrose action plan. Of course, the city and the county have been involved. And so what we really did was we divided this up into um, some main categories. Um, one being meet the market. And so meet the market and supportive housing. And so you know, we're really working with kind of a subgroup to looking at how can we meet the market? What affordable housing, how do we do this? I mean, we're thinking outside the box. There's um, the possibility of utilizing the redo district and making sure that maybe people in the Montrose area are, are adding a home um, to their already lot there in Montrose and to um, making sure that we have additional rentals available. Um, also, looking at tiny homes. I mean, we've talked about that a lot. Also, manufactured housing. But you know, the manufactured housing, some communities are are redeveloping those, but how can we find a financial mechanism to actually allow individuals that make a low income to actually get a loan for that manufactured housing? So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Um, we're also working on um, homelessness. Um, Housing Resources of Western Colorado is facilitating the coordinated entry system. And so this coordinated entry system is really about we have a list <laughs> of people that are experiencing homelessness and how can we prioritize those and actually increase our vouchers 
for Western Colorado and especially for the Montrose area. So uh, one person always told me if you don't count them, um, then they don't exist. And so Virgil really helped me with the data piece and what we had to do was start with data. And so with this data collection over the last year, like I said, we've been um, helping over 150 individuals, but really understanding what, what their needs are and who they really are. And so as we do that, Department of Local Affairs and Department of Housing will really say, okay, Montrose, yeah, it does look like that you need additional tax credits or additional vouchers for subsidized housing. How can we help you? And as long as we have those numbers, that will continue to increase over the next few years. We're also looking at, um, we've been working with um, mobile home communities. And so like I said, is how can we think outside the box and really that's our most affordable housing stock right now in the area. And how can we work with that, those individuals and also those mobile home communities to increase their capacity, but also make sure that they have a safe and healthy housing supply. Um, and so going back to also supportive housing is really looking at these figures on with um, the homelessness and really looking at supportive housing can actually provide um, mental health care and also case management kind of wraparound services. So is that something the community needs? Um, our small groups with Hilltop, the Center for Mental Health, um, and the county were also in, and also area on aging, we're also really talking about how we could actually um, develop a supportive housing unit in Montrose. But that's kind of in a nutshell. Um, but again, the most affordable housing stock is 30%. So right now we're at a time when $1,500 a month um, for rent is what people are paying. And so it's either going to be that multiple families are living together to actually afford this, or families are working three to four jobs to afford this. I will turn it over to Ian. stats, right? <laughs> Thanks so much for having me here. Susan Abbey, great job to control the great information. So my goal here is to define uh, what market rate housing is and it's kind of a fancy word for just saying supply and demand and what people are paying. Um, so I want to run with you guys uh, just a few numbers and kind of just go over what the open market uh, real estate market is doing here in Montrose. So just preference all this data I'm going to share with you guys. We're doing 81401, 81403 only. Those are the two zip codes we're pulling data from. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about all this. Also, we're referring to real property, which does not mean a uh, mobile home that has, let's just say, a uh, register with a DFV, for example. So you can't pick up and move it. This is a fixed, attached, has a permanent foundation uh, purged uh, to, the, to the real estate. So, <coughs> Um, obviously, you know, real estate is a hot topic right now. All kinds of people are wondering, wow, will this continue? 
what's driving all this, what, why is real estate so hot, and essentially it's, it's supply and demand. So um, the drivers, uh, Montrose was a, a hot commodity before the pandemic. Of course, we saw gains in prices about 7% um, since 2014 on average. So you saw that continue every year on average 7%. Um, back in 2019, it was around 11%. And then recently, we have equity gains of 20. This, this stat from looking at July numbers is 26%. And you pull August's numbers, you're looking at a rolling uh, three month uh, median sell price of 23% equity gain. And that's, or price gain, that's over the last 12 months. So, yeah, prices are super high. Um, what's interesting is that you hear, it's interesting, you can, you can hear a lot of people's banter and you can kind of jump on board with it and just agree with that without looking at the numbers. And our team was actually doing it. We're like, there's no inventory, there's no inventory, this is crazy, there's no inventory. And we actually looked at how many units had sold. So if you compare um, the first half of this year through July and the first half of last year through July, the units of actual homes selling are up 30%. The weird part is, is that inventory is down 48%. So how does that work, right? What's going on is if you look at quote unquote active inventory, that's homes available right now that you can make an offer on today, okay? What, what, what the disconnect is, is that what's really going on is, yeah, units are up, sales 3%, inventory's down 48%. Homes, when they hit the market, it takes about, you know, two days to two weeks for them to go into contract. So they are no longer active on the open market available for sale. So that's really what's happening. So unlike the nation where you see decreasing unit sales, Montreal is actually up 30% on units sold. So it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. And that's obviously what's driving prices, supply and demand. Um, people ask, okay, hey, who's coming here? Who are buying these homes? So you have the primary demographic is uh, Denver. Uh, then you have Arizona, people from Arizona. Um, then you have Texas, um, some Californians, uh, you have people from Oregon, kind of new uh, people from the you know Northwest coming in. Um, that's kind of a newer phenomenon. Um, but anyways, over the last, you know, it's, this is a lot of retirees coming in, they like the lifestyle, they like low taxes, um, different motivations. Um, back in 2020 and the COVID and all this is definitely fear, you know, fear of being locked down in a one bedroom apartment, you know, fear of riots and people protesting. Um, and so you're coming to not just Montrose, but essentially the Mountain West, which, um, you know, you have Arizona's included in that, you have Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, uh, Colorado. So uh, the Mountain West states are really getting a lion's share of people coming from more urban areas and coming to our places like Montrose. Um, so median sale price in Montrose is now four hundred uh, thousand. Um, that's as of these are these are July numbers. We look at August's numbers the same. It's four hundred thousand um, homes are right now are selling for one hundred percent of asking price. Uh, back in June they were selling for five percent over asking price, so 105%. So um, pretty much it's just hype. You can get a house and we tell our clients, we say, okay, listen, if you have to buy a house right now, it's time to go to war. You gotta help us to negotiate all kinds of strategies to get you in the door and out to compete other buyers um, to tie, or just, just wait and sit it out, you know? It's just wait, because it's you can't sustain this kind of in my opinion, at least, you can't sustain 20, 25%, 20% equity gain a year. It's just, there's no way. And so, because we haven't talked about this yet, but income, that's a big part of this, right? So if income have income gains have been stagnant relative to uh, equity gains and price gains in real estate. So that, that at a certain point, push comes to shove. Um, you know, can that sustain? Probably not. The monkey wrench throwing in all of this is, the retirement community or more maybe affluent or middle class people who are retiring and they're moving here with a bag full of cash, um, that kind of throws throws things, um, it throws a monkey wrench into the future because you don't know how many more people keep coming. Um, you know, the stock market sustains, people are pulling chips out of the stock market, buying real estate, um, the stock market's very high right now. And so you have that kind of activity which then drives our prices. You also have investors uh, nationwide cash buyers were 23% of uh, total buyers uh, in the last 12 months. 
So you have them out competing, um, let's just say first time home buyers. Another huge demand, you have uh, Generation Y or Millennials, they are coming of age, coming to their 30s. They are now going, wow, you know, real estate is their number one way to create wealth in America. I want a piece of that, I'm having kids now. And they are starting to compete in the market. And so they were about 30% of uh, home purchasers last year as a nation goes. Um, so yeah, basically, just the supply and demand, that's what's driving things. Um, for the future, can this sustain? Equity gains, we feel like, so right now, national headlines, I mean, headlines are fun, right? You pick something and you isolate it and you like elaborate it and you talk about it for a half hour and sell ads on that airspace, right? So the, the headline right now is, oh my God, the market's slowing, everyone, you know, the price is so high, market's slowing, and I'm also going, yeah, guys, it's uh, September 8th, so traditionally, when you go into the fall, it starts slowing down a little bit. You have school starting again, you have people going, ah, screw it, I missed out on the homes I wanted, I'm just gonna wait and watch football, you know, NFL starts, you know, and so people's natural habits are to slow it down in the fall and winter. A lot of real estate agents and people in the industry, for example, are going, oh my God, it's slowing down. I'm like, yeah, but we've been running at breakneck speed for the last 18 months. This isn't normal. Uh, so let's just all kind of go, yeah, Remember the fall season? Remember when we just used to drink eggnog? Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, watch NFL and eat turkey, like, and, and not work like, every Saturday? Like, yeah, that was a real thing, you know? So, um, long story short, yeah, prices are high. Do I see, do I see a bubble? No, I don't see a bubble. Um, could prices come down? Maybe if something catastrophic happened, maybe prices come down 10 or 15%? Yeah, that's nothing though, guys. I mean, we, if you've had, gains of 7% since 2014, and you had a gain of 11% in 19, and then, you know, 25%, 23%. I mean, that's, if, if even if stuff dropped 10 or 15%, that's that's really nothing to freak out about. Um, and again, I don't think we're in a bubble because it's basic supply and demand. So if you look at the National Association of Home Builders, their projection is new construction will not catch up until 2025. So this whole supply and demand story is real and it's going to keep happening until new construction catches up and by the way new construction is having a hard time even with you know i think the last thing i heard was in long beach you had 42 ship containers waiting to unload into long beach and ship containers to places like home depot that supply builders so you have a choke up of supply and that's it is not rocket science that's the main cause of prices going up and us having a very desirable and beautiful community so yeah thank you for your time Okay, what we will do now is have all three speakers come to the front, and if you have any questions, tell us who the question is for. We'll shift the mic between the three of them, and hopefully we'll get your questions answered. So, questions. So I don't know if you can answer this, Ian. Um, and I don't know, Evan, over there, if you want to chime in on this too. But um, can you answer I mean, within the last 18 months how many people you've worked with um, that you've helped buy houses for that are moving from places like Denver, Seattle, Phoenix, Dallas, whatever, and they're working remotely and, wor and working here in Montrose? Can you answer that? Do you know how? Do you have an idea of how many people are doing that? So keep in mind. If I answer a question like that, it's very um, vague. <laughs> it's skewed because we work with, we have specific marketing, we employ it, maybe other companies don't. It's, it's very much a microcosm of only our data. Um, so your question is, how many people are we, see, we seeing who are work, working or working remotely and moved here to and can work remote? That's your question. Yeah. Just, okay. Just between you and Evan. Yeah, yeah, Evan. What do you think on uh, remote workers? Like, like 10 or 15 percent. So that's 10 or 15 percent of your clientele that are getting paid, you know, Seattle, Denver, Phoenix, Dallas wages, and they're living in Montrose, paying Montrose 
uh, cost of living. Yeah, and yeah, that's more yeah. money chasing after the same number of houses. Yeah, that's that's correct. So, and, and couple that with the fact that we have a shorting or a, sh a shortage issue with housing, that's only propping the market. And up. we have excellent fiber internet too, if you haven't known <laughs> <laughs> I got it on my coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Make me work today. <laughs> That's great, great uh, presentation. Um, I'm interested in the uh, the uh, uh, supportive housing vouchers and uh, looking at uh, ending the cycle of homelessness. And I just was wondering uh, if you know how many of our uh, elementary and high school youth are are homeless, and are there any steps that the state or agencies taking to, to end that cycle? Well, that's a really hard question. And I think that the data has really been really hard to gather, um, especially um, in schools. But the last data that I saw from 2019, I believe, it was like around 264 children in our district we're homeless. And so that doesn't really, the teens or things like that, but you know, one thing we've really seen and CASA is doing an amazing job with helping um, homeless youth um, is that continues to rise as well. And so I think that on the horizon, um, I don't know, it's really about gathering our data and making sure that we have the best data to say this is what our community needs and I think telling the story to Department of Housing um, for state and federal vouchers so there's I think ultimately they're gonna put more money into housing I think there's millions and millions of dollars coming down the pipe but I think it's really gonna be up to us locally to say this is what we need to do and so that's why it's really good for um, a lot of the organizations that really collaborate and say, this is what we want our community to look like, and this is where we feel like those dollars should go. So I don't know if I really answered that, but um, there's people working on it, but I think that the more that we just talk about the issue, you know, um, homelessness does exist in our community, um, and, it, and it's happening all over. I think that, you know, and there's such a stigma around it, so, you know, educating others to be like, yeah, this really does exist, and let's try to, you know, talk about affordable housing without the stigma, because that's important, uh, I think, for all of our survival. Other questions? Just have a comment, I guess, or an observation. First of all, you have great job security, because this is never going to be solved. Um, so, good job. Um, but I would just encourage you in your coalitions or your homelessness groups where you're all trying to work together to um, include maybe the Humane Society or the Animal Shelter and also a smoking cessation uh, or healthcare sort of um, conversation to it because I have seen years and years and years and years of people being homeless because they have a pet or they're smoking and it's a choice. And so I would just encourage you to think about that. Thanks. Other questions? Do you have any idea how many people, or approximately how many people, are being subsidized and uh, living in hotels or motel rooms? Well, um, that's a that's a tricky question too because I will say, especially people that are just moving into the area. I mean, um, I've seen multiple individuals um, staying in hotels, and so we work with a hotel here in the area, and we usually have what Miriam about six to eight people a week, um, and that changes. So just just we help subsidize that. I have a question, and I'm not sure who would answer it. If we look at need for apartments, um, and it's, I think these numbers are close. If Matt Miles puts in 150 up by Cobble, and Colorado Outdoors starts with 76, that's 226. 
Is there a need for 226 apartments, or is there a greater need for single-family homes? I'm not sure I can answer that. I think there's just a need, and I think probably that, you know, we have people that would say, yeah, I would probably rather take my family and, and move into a single family home, but if it, the apartment's all that's there, we'll take it. So I honestly can't, I don't know, can either of you answer that? I'm not sure that we're seeing, people are struggling to find anything these days, and so um, I don't know that they're being that particular at this point. I just have a comment more than a question. I also serve on the Housing Coalition, and one of the things that we're up against on a regular basis is not in my backyard. So I would just encourage you, as we try to move forward to address these issues, please, please, please be open-minded when you hear about what we're trying to accomplish in terms of senior supportive housing and addressing the homeless issues and those kind of things. Please don't just rush to judgment and say, please don't put that in my neighborhood. Don't, we know there's a problem, but don't put it in my backyard. Please just be open-minded and hear us out when we bring a plan. Thank you. I think this is a question for Ian. I understand that, uh, or I heard a number that said one new home is, is completed as far as construction a day here in Montrose. Do you have any statistics that compare the ratio of the demand, the number of people moving into the community versus the, the homes that are being constructed? I don't. That could be easily found though if you compare building permits and just calculate it let's just say eight months out or seven months out um and yeah so that's that's data we can pull actually i have that in a few previous other um posts we've done on our blog um but i have not compared it apples to apples it's it what the number i don't know i don't want to know where to get is the amount of people moving here i think you can pull that data from the dmv records as far as, uh, you know, you have to register your vehicle the first, I think, year you're in Montrose. Um, and so you could register out of state DMV records registering in um, Colorado in Montrose and, and compare it to the new building permits. That would be a way to kind of see new construction supply versus new incoming demand. The only assumption you're making, though, is that the, the new DM, or the new vehicle registrations, we're not assuming they're buying a house that year. So that's a little bit of this, uh, but yeah, I, I don't have a perfect metric to track that per se. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I see a, uh, big increase in the amount of housing for manufactured and mobile homes uh, taking place. I live in Cimarron Creek and we got a big expansion going there. Will that eventually temper the you know, high cost of the real estate here? Or is there a, uh, uh, a proportion of manufactured housing uh, that is provided for the people moving here that's going to bring up down the total cost of housing? I'd say that as long as population, well, as long as population increase and demand does not increase, the more supply you add will level out the the cost of, of housing. That includes mobile and that includes uh, manufacturing, of course. Well, I'm just looking at it from a perspective standpoint. I'm sitting here and trying to remember I was discharged maybe 1961. And I was able to buy a house for around eight thousand dollars. But when I looked at my percent of income, 
It's roughly the same as this right now. In order to get the loan for that house, I had to have 30%, uh, in other words, 30% of my income had to be able to service the debt on that. So I guess I'm just wondering, are, are we really at a critical phase, or is this just kind of life as usual, uh, but are the wages really catching up with the housing? Or, uh, it just looks to me like we are slipping in some ways in wages versus uh, housing costs. Um, yeah, you're exact. You're spot on. So you know, I um, get on my soapbox about we talk about area median income, and for Montrose, it's about forty-five thousand dollars. And so I get on my soapbox about these people making thirty percent of that, or fifteen thousand dollars a year. You know, all it takes is one kid's hospital bill, or one, like Abby said, you're sick for a week and can't go to work, and you slip quickly to homelessness. So it truly is, in my opinion, the 30% AMI people that that really need some subsidized, some more subsidized housing. Again, we need a we need a, an official formal needs assessment done to prove that. But uh, every group that I'm in, they get tired of hearing me talk about the 30% AMI. Um, that's really the critical group, and I think it is. Those are the folks working at McDonald's or you know that kind of thing that the wages just aren't. And, and that's a double-edged sword. You know, how high can McDonald's wages go before you're paying $30 for a Big Mac, too? You know, so I do get that as well. But you are spot on. If you uh, look at wage growth and also um, the economic term like productivity, so we've had an issue in the U.S. that productivity um, increases and also just, you know, there's a ceiling on, on not a ceiling, there's just been a lot of pressure on wages and so yeah it has not caught up with uh, equity increase in real estate just uh, wanted to beat the supply and demand drum one more time and make a remark about Kathy's question and I think my hope is that the 260 units that are going to be they'll be new so they'll be attractive we've seen that happen at Woodgate people want to live in new so my hope is that that takes some of the rental pressure and investment um, pressure off of the downtown single family homes and make those more available for first time home buyers. That's my, that's my prediction, my hope. We can certainly hope. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? I know you're overwhelmed in a lot of areas. Uh, but is there any type of programs that can help youth coming in for seasonal work in this area? Yeah, I got nothing, not to my knowledge. <laughs> you know, um, they did change. They did change the status. Um, my counterpart there in the back row, Diana, I'm going to put you on the spot here for our for our farm labor workers that we could accept a different type of visa. The problem with that is that we, in our farm labor, um, USDA rural development requires a one-year lease. So typically those folks are coming in to work for the season. They're typically a single person, you know, a single uh, uh, person who's working in the field just for the season and then they go back. So it really doesn't work for what's already set up. Now, I don't know the complex in, in Delta, may, uh, they got of some variances there because they were unable to fill all their units, so they may be able to do a shorter term and, and be able to take those short term visa folks. Any other? So the city just uh, made some moves to um, clean up some of the trailer parks around. Uh, around town, which I think is long overdue. Um, if you have a, um, when you do uh, supportive housing, do you have a standard that, uh, that they have to meet? You know, some of these places um, you know, are one step away from uh, Reclamel. HUD does, we, we have a, a test that we have, to, uh, my inspectors have to pass ho housing quality standards. Um, but I'll give you the difference, you know, I, uh, when you buy a house and you hire an inspector, it takes them four or five hours to do that inspection. 
Um, our inspections take 30 minutes. So, you know, they require that the sewer works and that the stove works, um, but it certainly doesn't have to be brand new. Um, so, it, yeah, we do have standards, but the HUD standards are not buying a house standards. They are pretty low. Um, but again, if the standards were a whole lot higher, many of our rentals would not would not pass. So again, there's a double, you know, the, the uh, outlets have to work, it has to be safe and sanitary. Um, the roof can't leak, those kinds of things, but it doesn't, but, but they don't have to be the Taj Mahal. Any others? Okay, this will be our last. So the question is, are most of these people locals? Have they driven in from somewhere else and broken down? And are we creating a, the more low income housing we have, do we have the, the basis for people to work and get out of their rut? It seems like we're, we're perpetuating more and more of what we're, what we're trying to solve. I mean, I can <laughs> try to answer that. Um, there is a percentage of individuals that are um, moving in, um, mainly actually sometimes for a job. So I would say that, you know, we have kind of a 30% of those people that um, are becoming homeless or have never experienced it um, uh, have a lot of roots here. And so they've been here for generations. Um, another third is really around that supportive housing. Like they have um, some, some substance abuse issues or some mental health issues that really need to be addressed. And then maybe another third is really people coming in from um, out of town and either they, they usually come here because there's somebody here though. So a family moving in or, or something like that. Um, I think, I don't know, to answer your question about the issue really is, uh, well, number one is wages. Like, I think we need to continue to, to increase wages and also, you know, develop more programs around, you know, workforce development. Um, you know, what we're seeing too is kids uh, cannot afford college right now. And so those individuals in high school, um, if their family can't afford it or they can't go, that, you know, technical education is really important. And so how can we, you know, develop more of that? Um, but also we have to have the housing um, so they can actually go to the school here, you know, because um, it has to be affordable housing in order for them to get the education. So I don't think that, I think we just have to really be, um, you know, the mindset of thinking all of that um, kind of simultaneously is when we're looking at housing, um, if that answers your question. <laughs> and I'll answer for our wait list. Uh, this wait list, when we opened it last September, most of our folks were from right here in Montrose that applied for Section 8 housing. The time before we opened it, we had just passed, uh, we had just legalized marijuana, and many, many of those folks were from out of state then. But we, we've really seen a, 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 that slow down. Interesting, interesting conversations and questions. Thank you to the three of you. Thank you.